Good evening, my brothers and sisters. In our last visit together, we began with an invitation of Jesus where he invited us and he bidded us to come to him. For this evening's talk, we are going to be honored that our Lord and Savior himself is going to come to us. He's going to come to visit us in our homes. And what we're going to look at in this evening's talk is how do you know if you have encountered the living God and have been established in a relationship with him? Now, before I do that, um, over these past several encounters, these teachings, several times we've heard Jesus asking us to go and tell others about him. And I want to share with you uh, one of the experiences I had. In my, uh, when I was younger, I was involved in the pro-life movement and we would peacefully and prayerfully block the doors of abortion clinics in order that um, children would be saved. And as a result of this, I was sentenced to three months in federal prison. And in the early part of those three months, I um, was able to talk with some of my fellow inmates. And that was one of the times, in fact, the first time in my life where I realized that not everybody knows who Jesus is. Not everybody knows about his love and about his mercy. As I was bearing witness to Jesus and his love and his power to forgive sins, one of my fellow in inmates, he began to shed tears as he said to me, you mean Jesus loves me and that Jesus will forgive my sins? So my brothers and sisters, we want to avoid presuming that everybody knows about Jesus. And in particular, that everybody knows about his love and about his mercy. All the more reason for us to be inspired to go forth and to tell others about Jesus. So back to this evening's talk. How can we know if we have been established in a relationship with the living God, if we've encountered him? We so appreciated the visit of the prophet Isaiah. To begin to answer this question, um, we're going to return to the prophet Isaiah because we know that he had a relationship with the living God, that he encountered the living God. And we're going to look at three distinct traits about the prophet Isaiah. And by looking at these traits, we're going to be able to answer the question for ourselves whether or not we have encountered the living God and are in a relationship with him. One of the first traits we observe about Isaiah is that he hears the voice of the Lord. Um, when we go through scripture and the gospels and the teachings and the writings of, of St. Paul, he makes it very clear that this is an essential part of what it means to be a Christian, is we hear the voice of Jesus. So it's not enough for us just to quote unquote, say our prayers, that is to talk to God, that's very important. But what's of the essence is that we make space in our lives, we dedicate time to be in the presence of Jesus so that we might hear his voice. So Isaiah hears the voice of the living God. Isaiah also speaks to the living God, that is, he prays. And then also Isaiah speaks about God to others. We have seen that it is very natural that when you know the Lord and you love him, that it's very natural to tell others about him, to talk to others about this encounter that we've had with the living God. Now, the second trait that we observe about the prophet Isaiah is that he recognizes the presence of the Lord everywhere, not just in the temple. Isaiah recognizes the presence of the Lord at the city gates, in the marketplace, up on top of a mountain. Isaiah can be looking out at a field and he can see an enemy army marching towards Jerusalem to completely destroy it. And even in that moment, Isaiah is able to recognize the presence of the Lord. The third trait that we observe about the prophet Isaiah is that he experienced the very movements of the heart of God. So in that beautiful chapter, Isaiah chapter six, that we looked at before, when Isaiah enters the temple and he has this revelation of the glory of God and he hears the cherubim angels as they proclaim, holy, holy, holy. 
But then Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord. He experienced the movements on God's heart as he hears the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit say, Whom shall we send? Who will go for us? So once again, we're grateful for the life and the example of the prophet Isaiah because with these three traits, he helps us to understand that if we have encountered the living God and if we have been established in relationship with him, our life is going to look just like the prophet Isaiah. Now, as Catholics, we are so blessed with our holy church, the place where we go to worship the living God. And every Sunday, the bride of Jesus, she prepares this glorious feast for us. She composes this symphony where she weaves together the living Word of God, and also the actions of Jesus. And every Sunday when the Bride of Jesus does this, when she composes the symphony, where the living Word of God and the actions of Jesus come together, they reveal to us with stunning clarity that the Lord Jesus wants us to encounter Him, and He wants us to be established in a relationship with Him. So we just saw this in the life of the prophet Isaiah. And so we ask, well, does the Lord want this for each and every one of us? Is he inviting, is he calling each and every one of us to encounter him and to be established in this relationship? Now to answer this question, we're gonna turn first to the word of God, and then we're gonna turn to the actions of Jesus during the Holy, Holy Mass in order to seek a confirmation that in fact, the living God wants us to encounter him and wants us to be established in a relationship with him. We begin by looking at the book of Genesis chapter 18. We're also gonna look at the Gospel of St. Luke chapter 10. And in Genesis 18, Abraham welcomes the living God into his home. So you'll remember our last teaching, Jesus invited us to come to him so that we could learn from his heart that is humble and gentle. Today, we're gonna to see through the word of God that Jesus wants us to welcome him into our homes. So in Genesis 18, Abraham welcomes the living God into his home. In Luke 10, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus have this very same joy, this very same pleasure of welcoming the living God into their homes. So let us just listen to Abraham. Let us listen to Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. What was it like to welcome the living God into their homes? And they begin by just sharing with us their shared joy that the Lord God entered their homes, how he loved to spend time with them, how he loved to hear their voice. They tell us what a tremendous joy it was for they themselves to welcome the Lord, to hear his voice as he spoke to them. In this encounter, when we welcome the Lord into our homes, Abraham, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus tell us that at a certain point, the Lord God reveals to us that he understands the movements of our heart. Jesus knows what is on our heart and that when we welcome him into our homes, he is able to relieve all of our fears, all of our anxieties. He is able to renew and establish us in hope. And so Abraham and Martha and Mary and Lazarus tell us that this welcoming God into their homes, it changed their lives forever. And because it changed their lives forever, it also changed the course of history. So we've looked at the Word of God, the first part of this beautiful symphony that we experience every Sunday in our parish church, and we've received a confirmation that in fact the Lord wants each and every one of us, even now, to open up our hearts and to welcome Him into our homes. 
What we're going to do now is we're going to turn to the actions of Jesus. What we experience, what we see, what we hear, what we taste every Sunday when we enter into our Father's house and we see the actions of Jesus. We see our Lord take our bread, he takes our wine. And then by the power of the Holy Spirit, with his divine authority as the Son of God, Jesus transforms our bread and our wine into his most precious body and blood. Now, the stunning thing about the actions of Jesus, and once again, this is where, where we are in perfect agreement with all of our brothers and sisters in Christ, especially our Protestant brothers and sisters, who will tell us that there is only one sacrifice, that the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross on Good Friday is the only one true sacrifice. And our response to them is, Amen, brothers and sisters. And that is the extraordinary thing about the actions of Jesus in our church, is that what Jesus offers to his Father, his body, his blood, his soul and divinity, that is Good Friday. And so every time we enter our Father's house and we participate in the Holy Mass, you and I are given this extraordinary opportunity, this wonderful grace where you and I can draw near to the cross of Jesus Christ. We recall that our Lord God is outside of time. He is eternal. And by his grace and by his love, during the holy sacrifice of the Mass, you and I have this opportunity to transcend time, to go above time, and we can draw near to the cross of Jesus Christ on Good Friday. We can hear the voice of our Savior as he intercedes on our behalf to the Father. We can allow our sins to be washed away in the precious blood of Jesus and the blood and the water that flowed from the side of Jesus, the pure side of Jesus. And then we have that extraordinary opportunity, that extraordinary grace, that this one true sacrifice, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross, you and I are invited to share intimately in that sacrifice when we receive the body and the blood of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament. So now that we've looked at the action of Jesus, we see this confirmation that Jesus wants each and every one of us to encounter him and he wants to establish us in a relationship with him. And now that we've looked at the word of God and we've looked at the actions of Jesus, we can now see that the way that you and I can have the same experience as Isaiah. So remember, Isaiah heard the voice of God. Isaiah recognized the presence of God everywhere in his life. And Isaiah experienced the very movements of the heart of God. The way that you and I can have this very same encounter, this very same experience, is that when we receive the body and blood of Jesus during Holy Mass, we don't leave them on the front porch. We open wide the door of our heart and we welcome Jesus. We invite Jesus to come into our heart we invite Jesus to be enthroned in our heart. We ask Jesus to be the Lord of our life, the Lord of our families, the Lord of our work, the Lord of our relationships, the Lord over our finances. We lay everything down before Jesus and we ask him to be the Lord of our life. And this is how we have that experience of Isaiah. We have that experience of encountering the living God and we have that experience of being established in this personal relationship. Now, several times during this evening's teaching, we have heard from Abraham, Martha, and Mary that to encounter the living God and to welcome him into your homes, not only will change you, not only will transform your life, but it will also change the course of history. And so what I wanna do now is I wanna give you an example. I want to give you a confirmation that this is indeed true. 
and we want to look at three dates in history, 1646, 1656, and the year 2006. In the year 1646, St. Isaac Joe, a missionary preacher of the gospel, a saintly Jesuit, was bearing witness to the good news of Jesus Christ to the Native American Indians. And because he was proclaiming the good news and sharing the gospel, he was martyred for his faith in Jesus. He was brutally put to death. And we know as Christians that the blood of the martyrs is the seed for the birth of new Christians. Now in that very same village where St. Isaac Joe gave the ultimate testimony to Jesus Christ by shedding his own blood, in the year 1656, a little Native American Indian girl, Kateri, was born. She was to become the Lily of the Mohawks. She was to become the first consecrated virgin among the Native Americans. And so we see how the life, the testimony, the example of St. Isaac Job, his martyrdom changed the course of history because it made it possible for Kateri to come to know and to love Jesus, to encounter him, and to allow Jesus to transform her life. Now, let us jump to the year 2006. In the state of Washington, there was a little boy who had a flesh-eating bacteria that was ravishing him. The doctors intervened, they did some surgery. At the end of the surgery, they told the mother and the dad, prepare for your son's death. There is nothing more we can do for him. Well, because this little boy was part Native American Indian, they began to pray that Jesus, through the intercession of St. Kateri, would heal their son. And in God's wonderful providence, a religious sister whose name was Sister Kateri, she had a relic, a bone of St. Kateri, and she came to the hospital room to pray for that little boy. She set the relic of St. Kateri upon that little boy, and they begged Jesus, and they asked Jesus that through the intercession of St. Kateri, that little boy would be healed. Sure enough, my brothers and sisters, the next day the doctors did some tests, and they told the mom and the dad that the flesh-eating bacteria was completely gone, the little boy was healed, and he was going to be just fine. So my brothers and sisters, whether or not you encounter Jesus, whether or not you welcome him into your lives, it's not just about you, but it's about all those people that Jesus wants to touch, to heal, and to reach through your life. Amen.